the, uh, this little instrument, my little buddy here that I've been playing a bunch today, is the diatonic harmonica. I have a bunch of different ones because they're all, they come in different keys. The idea, when it was invented as a folk instrument in Germany in the uh, early 19th century, in the 1820s, was uh, somebody set it up uh, with this weird scheme a little later, maybe 1850s. It's called the Richter tuning. And basically, you blow, this is one in C, you get three octaves C major arpeggio, and you draw, you can hear that the draw is not symmetrical, it's not the same thing in each octave. And uh, somebody left out some notes on the bottom uh, in order to be able to get the, the G chord down here. So the two main chords in German folk music. See, th this is the only instrument I know of in the woodwind family that uses the breath in both directions. You can play single notes. You can play intervals. You can play chords. You can play rhythms. It's unbelievable how much stuff you can do. And I'm not gonna give away the punchline yet, but that's why they left those notes out in the bottom octave, is to be able to play the melodies up here. You can see at the seventh hole, it turns backwards. There's too many draw notes in an octave compared mm. to C, E, G. You got D, F, A, and B. So at the seventh hole, the thing is backwards. Until they run out of notes on the top. <laughs> There's no B up there. So each octave is totally different world. But the idea is you play melodies in the middle. Or... It harmonizes simple diatonic melodies like an auto harp. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's great. Now, when the harmonica came to America in sometime in the eighteen seventies, maybe I don't, I'm not sure exactly when. Black blues musicians, and the blues had been around for a long time by that point. They picked up the instrument, and instead of playing "Pop Goes the Weasel" in C. If you play that same basic idea based on the inhale, you get the Mixolydian mode. You get a blue shuffle automatically. <laughs> there it is. The Germans had no idea that anyone would ever use the instrument to play music like this. But basically, it's sort of like a white key piano. You can play any of the seven modal positions on the white keys. You can play. And on the bottom, there's a bunch of notes missing. Well, it turns out that as if by magic, you can fill in the missing notes by changing the resonance of the inside of your mouth. And you have a vacuum created by your nose being closed. And you can bend these pitches down the higher pitch note on a hole that's the draw that's the blow you can bend the draw note by moving <laughs> your tongue there like a little backward trombone slide into your throat mm. and there's the g flat and the f and the same on the third hole <laughs> and so when these guys were doing these blues shuffles not only could they do the rhythm, but they could also do the soloistic stuff. All those notes you need to bend to play the blues, they're all there as if by magic. Wow. <laughs> and the Germans, needless to say, had not anticipated this. <laughs> and so after a while, harmonicas were selling like hotcakes in America because people wanted to play blues. And of course there were people playing folk music and polkas and stuff on them, but 
blues was what really made the harmonica take off in America and England, and then eventually all over Europe, South America. And the, those, those guys in Bavaria, they just thought, oh, all these crazy people, they're breaking the harmonicas, they're playing them wrong, but we're making so much money, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I got inspired by hearing great blues harmonica players like Paul Butterfield and James Cotton and Little Walter mm -hmm. and uh, Sonny Terry and uh, uh, Junior Wells, hearing them on records. And then I went to hear a live show with Paul Butterfield and uh, James Cotton, their bands, the, the, the best versions of their bands mm. at, a, at a club in the Greenwich Village when I was like 16 or 17. And this changed my life. I, I just, oh my God, I got to play the blues. And of course, I figured out that that 12 bar blues progression using the one, the four and the five chords is something I'd been playing for years without realizing it. Mm. And uh, so I, you know, played blues on the piano with my band that I had, uh, a bunch of buddies in high school. Uh, and the drummer taught himself how to play harmonica. <laughs> and he impressed my girlfriend. I thought, hmm, I better <laughs> learn how to do this. <laughs> and so I went to Manny's Music on West 48th Street and bought a harmonica and went over, took the subway to my friend's house and said, show me how to bend those notes. And he couldn't because it was all just instinct. Mm. I said, oh, what do you mean you can't show me? Well, it's in my mouth. I can't explain it. So... To make a long story, it's a very long story, but to make it a lot shorter, <laughs> I, I figured out how to bend the note one day. I took the harmonica to college, and it was during freshman orientation week, and I attended a, a rally for the Chicago 7, who had been charged with conspiring uh, to incite riot at the 1968 uh, Democratic Convention. And I was, it was my first week at Northwestern. I didn't know anybody. I went to this rally, because I was very much against the Vietnam War. And it was just a wild experience. And I had this G-harp in my pocket from Manny's, not this one, that's long gone, mm. that I had bought for $2.25. And I had been, you know, <laughs> honking away at it, sounding horrible. You know, uh, Bob Dylan could have given me lessons. But, uh, sorry, Bob. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I just sounded miserable. And uh, somehow I picked it out of my pocket at the end of this rally. And I, I bent the fourth hole draw. And it's like, oh my God, that's how, that's how you do it. And then soon I was bending all the other holes. And I didn't have all the finesse that I have now, but I was, I figured out all these bends in like in a half an hour. Mm. It was just like, you know, a revelation. And then. I, I sat in my dorm room and just practiced and practiced and practiced. At the same time as I was already a pretty good jazz pianist, I was trying to, you know, you not only just play blues licks, but try to figure out how the instrument worked. Like, what else can I do on it? And I discovered that there were all these missing notes. Ah, that's impossible. It's a musical instrument. How could notes be missing? Hmm. And the next thing I discovered how to do was to bend the blow notes on top of the harmonica because they're higher up there. Mm. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I, some, most of my harmonica heroes didn't play up on the top of the harp. Mm. But there's missing notes. Like if you try to play a chromatic scale, there, there's all sorts of notes there. But... There's mm. four notes that are not there already. Mm. It's like you go to a practice, you know, practice building at the music school and you walk into a room where the piano has some broken keys. You, you walk out and you find one where the keys aren't broken. <laughs> but here, I just couldn't find them. I was so frustrated. So then I started thinking, well, what if I try to bend notes that can't bend? Like try to bend the blow notes on the bottom of the harmonica because you can only bend the draw notes there. Let's see what happens. So I'm trying this one day on the sixth hole on a G harp, just like this. So you get D, E flat, E, F sharp, but you can't get the F natural. Mm. Just for to be able to play. 
to play the four chord. You can't play the five seven. <laughs> mm. Or just a normal guitar lick. Da da da. Mm. Can't play any of that stuff. Oh, so frustrating. So I'm I'm bending on it and sound like a dying a dying dog, you know. Oh, oh, you know. <laughs> and suddenly this other note pops up. At first I couldn't get it separate. It sounded kind of like that. <laughs> but wow, that's a weird sound. And then I realized if I could separate it, it's the missing F. <laughs> wow. And I thought, well, mm. I found that missing note. Maybe all the other places on the harmonica where the notes are missing, you do the same thing, they'll come out. It's true. Mm. Mm. And on the top, I figured you do it the exact opposite. You draw, and then and the missing notes come. Now I have a three octave chromatic scale on this instrument. Wow. I'm an 18 year old college student. I thought, it's impossible that I'm the first person to figure out how to do this. And it turned out some other people, really obscure, had, had squeaked out a few of these notes on the recordings. Mm. But like, nobody had ever made a real thing of it. Mm. Uh, one guy was trying and he turned out, he didn't like the way he sounded and he stopped a few years before me. Um, and so I, d I vowed that I would try to play every kind of music as, that I possibly could play on the piano on this instrument. Mm. Try to bring, b b while still maintaining the blues equality of it. Mm. See, I mean, I, I didn't like the chromatic harmonica with the button on it because it, it sounded sort of mechanical. Mm. And so this instrument to me seemed like just so soulful. So, you know, I started out playing Chicago blues. Like, Standard shuffle, Sweet Home Chicago, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and then I, you know, tried to take it into other types of music. And once again, uh, the more different kinds of music I played, sometimes years later I would discover the Jewish connections to mm. these forms of music. Like Chess Records in Chicago was started by uh, two Jewish brothers whose family had a furniture store down on Maxwell Street which is where the black blues musicians used to come and jam on Sunday mornings after their Saturday night gigs. Mm. And it was a, 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 like a market with push carts where people sold all sorts of stuff, like on the Lower East Side of New York. But the, but the blues musicians, that was a uniquely Chicago element. And, uh, you know, the Chess Brothers, they heard all these guys and they said, you know, nobody's really recording these people. And some of them are really great and they have big audiences when they play in clubs. Mm. They started Chess Records, which was ah. the world's leading blues label. I mean, Muddy Waters recorded on it, and uh, Junior Wells, and mm. uh, Buddy Guy, and all these people. Uh, James Cotton, everybody was on Chess. You know? And uh, so that was, uh, and later, when Chess, chess uh, disappeared after a while, uh, another label started in Chicago called Alligator Records, started by another Jewish <laughs> entrepreneur named Bruce Siglauer. And he recorded all the modern uh, blues musicians, uh, not just Chicago, but from all over the world. Wow. Uh, and uh, so once again, like blues and Jews in Chicago, it's like they're intertwined. Oh, yeah. Um, to a great degree. Uh, and, uh, you know, Benny Goodman, this is another really interesting story. Uh, Chicago was really the world's cap blues capital in the late 1920s. All the famous New Orleans musicians came here and people from other cities as well, just like Kansas City was a little later, for, for, um, and of course New York eventually became. 
but uh, Jelly Roll Morton and Louis Armstrong and Earl Hines, all those guys were playing on the south side in these big clubs. And Benny Goodman grew up next to the stockyards in Chicago. His father was a butcher, came home with blood all over himself. Uh, you know, a tough job. Uh, and uh, Benny and his high school friends used to sneak out at night and go to these jazz clubs and hear all these great black jazz musicians. And uh, the first hit record that he made was a Jelly Roll Morton tune called The King Porter Stomp, arranged by the great Fletcher Henderson. And so, you know, they called Benny the King of Swing, you know. But it was, again, this interconnection between Jewish musicians and, and black musicians that, that created the, Benny Goodman's career as, mm -hmm. as a swing and jazz musician. He was so in, it was incredibly inspired by these great black musicians that he heard. And he didn't exactly want to sound like them. He, he had his own thing, mm -hmm. but he was very soulful and bluesy too. You know, Chicago has a blues thing, you know. And when I moved here, it deepened that part of my musicality, you know, in a way that living in New York wouldn't have done, you know. So Jelly Roll Morton had his own style of blues. Uh, it, had, it had, like, different chords in it. Like, uh, uh, it was like... It almost doesn't sound like a 12-bar blues, but it is. Mm -hmm. It's got that rich, swampy New Orleans feel, you know? A lot of humidity. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I recorded one of his tunes called The Sidewalk Blues. As, uh... introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so that had that, you know, almost like a classical form. It goes to mm. different sections, you know. And uh, yeah, Jelly Roll is one of my 
super favorite musicians. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, unbelievable genius, an, uh, amazing singer, incredible uh, historian of jazz with a photographic memory for everything that ever happened in his life. Wow, man. So I discovered that that tune was in all probability recorded in the ballroom of what used to be called the Webster Hotel, which I, I had known it as the jazz showcase in the early 70s, uh, Joe Siegel's club. Uh, which was located there for a while. It moved like five times. But I, I actually was in that room. I heard McCoy Tyner play there. I heard mm. like all sorts of people play there. And that was the room with that, I think, where that was recorded in 1926 or 27. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Early RCA Victor recording. I was just curious. I mean, uh, when you play harmonica and piano at the same time, does, yeah. is, is that kind of by now like playing piano with two hands or is it a totally different thing for you? Well, it should be. I screwed up a bunch of stuff. Right there. <laughs> but uh... this one is sticking too. Mm. It's hard to do this with the headphones on. Ah. Yeah, I see the harmonica in my mind as a piano. That's how I do what I do. It's not mechanical, it's mental. Yeah. <laughs> Playing an A flat minor on the G harp, you know, <laughs> because, and I, the G was the first one that I bought, so I tend to see that one in my mind as a direct link to the piano more than the other key. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and hope that you'll join us back here next week. As a nonprofit, we can only afford to put on great programming like this thanks to your support. Please visit naranaarts.org for more information and to learn how to get involved.